All right, everybody. So as Angela said, my name is Ashley Dressel. I'm a physical therapist here with physical therapy at ACAC. I work at our Pantops location. And we're gonna go ahead and get started with the presentation now. So we'll be talking about Parkinson's disease and we're gonna touch on a couple topics. So we're gonna touch on fall risk, home safety and exercise considerations. And like Angela touched on, if you have any questions or anything like that, there's a little chat icon kind of down at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to type me out a message and I'll either try to answer as we go or if that doesn't really seem to work, we can always come back to them and revisit at the end. So we'll get started. So the objectives I wanna get through today are just really expanding everyone's knowledge base and their understanding about Parkinson's disease and identify some key components that affect those people living with Parkinson's disease. I also wanna help you guys understand the current research and treatment strategies and then be able to take that research and be able to implement that for home safety strategies and some treatment strategies as well. So we'll show some video clips at the end with some exercises that we can start working on. All right, so what is Parkinson's disease? I'm sure most of you know a lot of this information, but I just wanted to review it anyway. So it is the second most common neurodegenerative disease globally with a prevalence of 400 to 1900 cases per 100,000 people worldwide. And there's almost 1 million cases right now in the United States. So what Parkinson's disease affects is it primarily works against the dopamine producing, which are dopaminergic neurons in an area of the brain called the substantia nigra. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter, which is, is essentially kind of like our body's communication um, chemicals. So by the time of diagnosis for people with Parkinson's disease, almost 60 to 80% of those dopamine producing cells have actually died at that point in time. And what this does is it affects, like I said, that area called the substantia nigra. And that is an area kind of in your midbrain that has synapses, which are essentially just kind of the gateways, they're the connections between the different parts of our brain and it connects with the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia is a part of our brain that really controls functions ranging from voluntary movement, cognitive planning, emotions, reward functions, and learning. So some risk factors and causes for Parkinson's disease. Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting. To you're look okay, over there. No, you're fine. <laughs> Our um, age. So in general, there's an increased risk over the age of 62 years old, and there's only a slightly higher risk for men at 1.2%. And the causes, they mostly remain unknown. 85% of cases are considered idiopathic, which that just means essentially we're not really sure why they happen. Um, there's a lot of um, research on it and they have found links to both environmental factors and some genetic factors. So as you can see, some of the environment or environmental factors include um, pesticides, herbicides, industrial chemicals, heavy metal exposure, and exposure to Agent Orange. And then the genetic factors you can see there, those are just some of the genes that have kind of been linked with Parkinson's disease. So the prognosis, um, it really ranges from person to person, but a poorer prognosis has been associated with older age, earlier onset of cognitive impairments, multiple comorbidities. So that's just other diseases that people can have, such as you know, diabetes, heart disease, COPD, things of that nature. Um, also, poorer prognosis is associated with kind of a greater level of baseline impairment. So just, you know, a lower functioning at the start of when they are diagnosed with the disease, um, as well as a decreased response to dopaminergic medication, which we'll touch on. That's the primary medication given to those with people with Parkinson's disease. And then the big two are a decreased activity level and social isolation. And I just wanted to go through some of the common symptoms for those with Parkinson's disease. So there's a really long list of symptoms that we could go through, but 
what I want you guys to understand is that not everyone will have every single one of these symptoms. It's very kind of individualized how individuals present, but some of the most common motor symptoms are more so kind of body muscular symptoms with typical Parkinson's disease are bradykinesia, which is just slower muscle movements, hypokinesia, so decreased bodily movement. So just moving smaller when you're reaching, when you're walking, things of that nature. Rigidity, poor postural control leading to poor balance, tremor, um, Parkinsonian gait, which is kind of associated with shuffling, short step length, decreased arm swing on both sides, and what we call freezing. So when somebody's trying to walk and it seems as if they just get frozen in space as well as decreased physical capacity, which physical capacity is a combination of muscle strength, muscle tone, muscular endurance, as well as exercise tolerance and joint mobility. And some of the more common non-motor symptoms are cognitive impairments, depression, visual impairments, including poor depth perception, perception um, poor accommodation for low lighting, as well as contrast sensitivity, which contrast sensitivity is say you're reaching into a busy kind of kitchen drawer. It's that ability to distinguish one item from another item. So that's what contrast sensitivity is, as well as fatigue and sleep disruption and gastrointestinal issues as well. So it's not just the motor symptoms. There's a lot of other non-motor symptoms that go along with it. So for medical management, there's not a cure as of now, but there is a heck of a lot of research going on with Parkinson's disease. Um, medications right now tend to help with the bradykinesia, so that slow movement, rigidity, and tremor in order to really try to optimize people's movement patterns and their functional mobility. Unfortunately, they do not help people's balance. Now the different medication types are Dopamine replacing, this is the most commonly prescribed. This is the carbidopa levodopa that most individuals um, have probably at least tried out when diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And the next group of medications are dopamine agonists. So they don't replace the dopamine, but they try to act like it. And you can see some of the um, prescription medication names here. There's also dopamine extenders. So those essentially just try to extend the life of the dopamine that's already in your system. And then anticholinergics, those are essentially just for trying to help control the tremor. So there's a couple of things to consider when it comes to medication management. One of the biggest ones is medication timing. So there's really a therapeutic window of the effectiveness of the medication on individual's function. Um, I like to use, I heard this at one of my continuing education seminars, was the gas tank analogy. So essentially thinking of yourself as a machine that needs to be fueled by gas. You know, we need that gas to run. And typically the medication, um, that carbidopa levodopa, lasts for about a six hour window before the next dose is required. Unfortunately, as the disease progresses, your brain can't keep gas in the system for as long as it previously did. And your tank, quote unquote, needs to be refilled sooner. And like I said, this is dependent on the disease progression, not the total amount of time that you're on the medication. So it's really important to grade activity to maintain energy levels and safety when you're doing you know, activities of daily living, both at home and when you're out in the community. So when it comes to medication, you really want to think about how um, you're taking the medication, essentially. So you want to make sure that you're getting your medication on time to, present, to prevent those quote-unquote off periods. A typical prescription is usually three times a day, which could mean a couple different things, as you see I've put here. A lot of the times people do it as a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But things to consider with that is that protein is absorbed through the same channels in the gut and in the intestines as um, the medication typically is. 
and protein wins. Protein is bigger. So your body's going to uptake that protein and it's not going to uptake the medication in the way that it should. So just something to consider if you're basing your medication around your meal times is to avoid protein intake 30 minutes before or after taking your dopamine replacing medication because it's essentially just kind of canceling it out if you do that. Another way that people tend to take their medication is kind of like a morning, noon, and night schedule. But it's just something to consider is do we really need the medication that's going to help an individual with their movement once they're in bed? What if you take it a little bit earlier in the evening when you're really getting ready to, you know, get dressed and ready for bed, take a shower, get in bed? So those are just things to consider that you could talk to if, with your therapist, if you're seeing a physical therapist, or certainly your doctor who is managing your Parkinson's disease. And just another option or another um, thing to consider is side effects of these medications. These are just kind of some common ones that have been found across the board are lightheadedness, low blood pressure, confusion, and some issues with impulse control, which as you can see, add up to an increased risk of falls. So I just wanna start to go more into falls specifically here. So these statistics are all per the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. More than one in four Americans aged 65 years or older experiences a fall each year. And falling once doubles your chances of falling again. One out of five falls causes a serious injury, such as broken bones or a head injury. And fall death rates in the US increased 30% from 2007 to 2016. And a fear of falling has actually been found um, to increase your risk of falls and therefore kind of leads to a decreased physical activity levels just because people are fearful of falling while doing those activities, which then leads to a further decline in their strength, their mobility, and therefore their function. So we're going to shift now into some home safety considerations. That way we can do as much as we can to diminish that fall risk we just spoke about. So when we're thinking about home safety, the environment is a big consideration we need to pay attention to. For safe ambulation or walking around your home, there's a few things to think about. If possible, you really wanna avoid floor patterns. So there's really busy carpets that you see like in hotels, you want to remove central furniture. So, you know, if you have like a big coffee table kind of in the middle of your pathways, it would be a good idea to move that out of the way. You want to remove any clutter from pathways, anything that um, anyone could slip on, trip over, things of that nature. Like I said, remove tripping hazards. Some of the biggest things we see with falls are, you know, a loose carpet where the edge is kind of coming up out of the corner and slippery throw rugs as well. So there's easy things that you can do to fix that, you know, tack that carpet down. You can get um, kind of the double-sided tape. You could tape down your throw rugs just to make sure that you're as safe as possible within your home. You also wanna think about allowing direct access and direct pathways to sitting surfaces. So if you or your loved one really has, you know, a, you know, their favorite recliner that they love to sit in and, you know, a favorite chair kind of in each room, if you can really try to open up the pathways to those chairs and those sitting surfaces, they'll be a lot safer. And also thinking about thresholds. So a lot of the times where people run into issues going from one room to the other is if there's that little bit of a threshold, that little like metal piece that goes between the two flooring surfaces from room to room. Now, if possible, if those can be removed and there's a relatively flat surface, that's ideal. If not, what you can actually do is get a long carpet runner and you can place it kind of halfway between each of the room entrances. So place it so that it goes kind of flush against your floor. You can always tape it down like we talked about and put that runner so that it's a nice even transition from room to room instead of hitting that bump. That's where, like I said, a lot of people run into tripping and they also can freeze at those thresholds as well. 
So I'm going to review a little bit of taping techniques that you can utilize if possible if you or your loved one are having difficulty with freezing walking around the home. And I'll show you some pictures after this slide. So these um, um, kind of cues and tips will make a little bit more sense in a second. So essentially what you can do is you can apply strips of colored tape. So something like electric tape or duct tape or something that's easy to put down on the ground, but also easy to come back up and won't damage the floors, especially electric tape or painter's tape. Um, the size you want to get is approximately 18 inches long for each of your strips. It doesn't have to be exact, but something close to 18 inches. And you want something that's a bright color, that's a bright contrast to the floor and to the environment that you're in. So what you can always do is you yourself or your loved one can kind of look at the different colors of um, the tape. The brightest colors and the ones that um, individuals with Parkinson's disease tend to do the well with is like a bright yellow, a bright orange, a green or a red. And you can just see and say, you know, which one stands out the most to you and pick that color and utilize that color. Then now the distance for the tape pieces from each other. Ideally, you want to try to make it about as far from one another as the individual's kind of step length. And that you can use in a hallway situation, which like I said, I'll show you a picture in a minute. And you can also use it for corners. And those are places where individuals with Parkinson's disease really tend to freeze up a lot, is in hallways and around corners. And for the cueing that you would give to someone, you can do it either way. You can say step on the tape strips or step um, between the paint strip or the tape strips. So here's a picture of that. So here's that kind of corner setup that I was talking about where you do a fan shape. And what they've found for individuals with Parkinson's disease is the body and the mind, the connection to be able to kind of have the brain tell the body to keep moving, take big steps, gets diminished, and that communication kind of gets hard. So if you can give them something extrinsically, so something outside of their body that cues them to walk bigger and walk more consistently, such as the tape pieces you see here, they tend to do better with this versus just saying, take big steps, keep moving. So this is just an easy trick. I unfortunately didn't have any fun tape to work with, but as you can see, the black actually stands out pretty well against our flooring that we had in the clinic. So that's also an option as well. So there's the corner with the fan shape, and then here's the hallway. Now, ideally against that kind of floor, you would want one of those bright colors so that it really stands out. And like I said, for the cueing for someone initially, you can either step, trying to step on the tape pieces, or you can try to step in between. And either way, that's gonna give that body, their body and their brain the cue to keep moving and keep those steps going to hopefully present prevent some of that freezing that can occur. So some additional home safety considerations can be easy fixes such as installing grab bars, which you can get at most of your local kind of home renovation stores. Um, you want these in places where transfers, so getting up and down tend to happen. So such as by your tub, your shower, your toilets. Also installing handrails by steps and stairways just to give a little bit of upper extremity and hand support, which helps balance and decreases fall risk. Adding some non-slip surfaces in areas that can really get wet and be dangerous, such as showers or tubs, just get some of those little grippy stickers that you can stick on the bottom of the surface. Um, sometimes what I've had my patients do before is actually get um, kind of like the water shoes that you would wear, you know, if you're going out in a lake or something like that, where they have those nice grips on the bottom. And I've had people wear those while they're showering or getting in and out of the tub to improve their safety. Um, avoid walking around the house without um, footwear, with gripper, with gripping bottoms and with kind of a closed in heel. Where people run into a lot of issues is just walking around the house in socks and they hit one of those slippery surfaces such as tile or wood floors and you know you just lose your balance and it's hard to 
regain your balance for those with Parkinson's disease, especially if it progresses and they have some weakness going on as well. Um, and then also lighting is a big thing. As we said, the kind of depth perception and ability to really distinguish items in the dark becomes harder and harder. So making sure that you're providing extra lighting in poorly lit areas and at nighttime. So, you know, at night, it's especially important if you're getting up and going to the bathroom a lot to make sure that your pathway to and from your bathroom is well lit. So putting night lights or putting those little lights that you can stick to the wall and just kind of press on are easy fixes that you can just use with a little tape to the wall, nothing too big or too crazy. So now we're gonna shift gears out of home considerations and fall risk and start talking a little bit more um, about exercise and how exercise is some of the best medicine for individuals with Parkinson's disease. So recent research shows the following for those with Parkinson's disease. That exercise, most importantly, is safe. Exercise improves the movement symptoms. So like we talked about, that slower movement pattern, the rigidity, the smaller movement patterns. And exercise actually changes the brain, which is called neuroplasticity, and can actually slow and halt the disease progression if it the exercise is done consistently and dosed appropriately, which we will touch on in the next couple slides. And like I just mentioned, consistency is key when it comes to exercise. So some further research here I just wanted to touch on briefly. They've shown that assisted cycling, just a single session of this at a high cadence, so that's just a high kind of pace was well tolerated and most individuals that participated showed improvements in both tremor and bradykinesia. Boxing for 90 minutes for 12 and 24 weeks was safe and showed improved balance and gait scores. So what I mean by gait scores is um, therapists can do certain tests that kind of look at an individual's walking dynamics and their speed of walking, which can be associated with fall risk. They've also shown dance. This um, specifically looked at a tango program twice a week for one year, was safe and showed improved gait, so walking, balance, dual tasking ability, and fine motor skills. So fine motor skills are those kind of things such as like using utensils, typing, writing, buttoning up your shirt. Um, they've also found that treadmill walking so walking four days per week on a treadmill at 60 to 65% or 80 to 85% of heart rate max was safe and improved overall Parkinson's disease rating scales. So those rating scales essentially are something that doctors and therapists can use that look at an individual's kind of function, their body movements, their walking and their balance, and it can grade essentially the severity of their Parkinson's disease. And I know some of you are probably wondering, you know, how do I know heart rate max? And we'll touch on that in a couple slides here. So just some considerations when we're thinking about exercise. If you or your loved one really aren't much into exercise, activity is the place to start. So just, you know, moving around at home, doing chores, going out in the yard and trying to do a little bit of yard work. Start with activity, build up your tolerance to that, and then we can start worrying about the actual prescribed exercise. And when it comes to that, any exercise is better than nothing. So just like I was touching on, do what you can when you can, because inactivity accelerates the progression of the disease and therefore it progresses individuals' functional decline. So when it comes to exercise with the goal of neuroplasticity or those brain changes that we talked about, there's four key components. Number one is intensity. So like I talked about in the last slide, there's a goal of above a 65% heart rate max. And an easy way to calculate that is just taking the number 220 and subtracting your age and that gives you just kind of a gross estimate of the 65% of your heart rate max. And the way you can do that is just basically, um, I'm sure most of you know the technique of kind of pressing on your wrist to feel your heart rate. And you can just kind of do that for about a minute, count how many times you feel 
your heartbeat and you can see if you're in that correct range. There's also little um, things that are called a pulse oximeter or a pulse ox that just kind of go on your finger. You've probably had those put on at a doctor's appointment or if you've ever gone to the hospital um, that easily read out your heart rate. And you can get those at pretty much any drugstore or you can go on Amazon and look up a pulse ox. So back to our four key components. Number two is complexity. So essentially, you want to do new activities, so such as you know going dancing or boxing, things that most of us may have briefly done but haven't really delved into, is a great way to kind of keep that mind and keep that body guessing and learning. Number three is timing. So we need to think about performing these exercises during the quote unquote on period. So when your medication is really helping you the best. And then saliency. So we need to believe that the exercise is gonna work for us and have fun with it. Because if you don't believe it's gonna help, it, you might not get as much out of it. It really is about you know, confidence and having fun and finding activities that are fun for you. So as we saw from a couple slides ago, there's so many different options. There's boxing, swimming, walking, dancing. So find what works for you and go with that. So when it comes to exercise prescription, the goal is about 150 minutes of that high intensity aerobic. So that's kind of getting the heart and lungs going activity. And that high intensity, like we talked about, is that 65% to 85% heart rate max. So biking, walking, swimming, boxing, as we've touched on, are all great um, options there. And then we wanna do strength training two to three times per week, which we're gonna go over some strength exercises here in a couple minutes, as well as balance training two to three times per week, which we'll also get into in a couple minutes as well as flexibility training daily, following your aerobic training, so your walking, your swimming, et cetera. So today I'm gonna to provide you with some basic suggestions for exercises, mostly targeting posture and balance to really try to help diminish that fall risk we talked about earlier. So with this, I ask that you rely on your own intelligence, your knowledge of your health history, and any comorbidities that you have, as well as self-assessment of your balance when starting a new exercise or activity to decide what's really safe and appropriate for you. Now, if you're not sure about this, I would really highly suggest that you speak to one of the members of your healthcare team before beginning any kind of program or come in and see us here at Physical Therapy at ACAC and we can do an initial evaluation because we really are movement specialists and we're well equipped to assess if a program targeting you know, your strength, your balance of Parkinson's disease is appropriate for you at this time. So we're gonna start to go into our exercises now here. So actually I have fibbed. Before that, we're gonna review what a safe corner is. And a safe corner is where I would suggest that you do your exercises just to help decrease any kind of fall risk when you're working on new exercises and activities. So I'm just gonna show you a little video clip of one of our athletic trainers, Renee, demonstrating what this safe corner is. So essentially, you wanna find a nice kind of open corner of your home, and you want your feet about six inches from the wall. As you saw there, where she kind of fell backwards, she was about a foot, a foot and a half away from the wall, and when she lost her balance, she really didn't have much to catch her there. So you wanna be about six inches so that you're close to the wall in case you lose your balance backwards, it catches you. And then also, so she's back to showing the six inches. You also should put like a nice sturdy chair or a heavier piece of furniture that's gonna give you that support in front of you just in case you lose your balance forward. So you're really protected from all angles here in this safe corner. All right, so now we're gonna go into some postural strengthening. For most individuals with Parkinson's disease, they tend to get a rounded forward posture at their head and their shoulders and their upper back, which unfortunately changes the way that your body kind of has control over its balance. So if we can work on strengthening those posture muscles to get 
an individual standing up taller with better control, that's going to further decrease their fall risk. So the first one is literally just what's called a postural hold. So Renee is going to demonstrate that here for us. So initially, she's just going to sit in a chair with, um, you know, you want to have support, but you actually want your bottom to be scooted forward in the chair so that you're not relying upon the chair for support. Let me backtrack that a little bit. And you want to watch and see how she's got her head up nice and tall. She's got her shoulders back, her hands in her lap. Now the way to progress this is going into a standing position, using the chair for support for your balance. Once again, head up nice and tall, shoulders back, standing with what I call nice proud posture. And then a way to progress this and make this harder is to not hold on. So that's gonna work your balance a little bit there. Once again, proud posture. Our next exercise here is what's called a chin tuck. So initially, I think it's easiest to start this exercise laying down on your back with your head supported by a pillow. And the idea of this exercise is that you're trying to kind of tuck that chin down and give yourself a double chin. It's not as if you're nodding and trying to bring your chin towards your chest. It's really almost like a chicken where they can kind of bring that head back. And then once you master it laying down, you can go and do it in a standing position or a seated position as well. Now our next one here involves a little bit of these resistance bands as do some more of our other exercises. So these are easily found at any sporting goods store. You can find them at Walmart in the sporting goods section. They also um, sell them online on Amazon. If you just look up resistance bands, you should find them pretty easily. And what you can do, you can kind of see me standing off to the side here. You can have one of your loved ones kind of hold it and anchor it. Or for most of them, you can tie it kind of around a doorknob or tie it to like a stair railing or a stair banister. You just want it to be a nice stable support system so that that band doesn't come back at you because it essentially is kind of like a big rubber band, so it doesn't feel good when that happens. So make sure it's nice and safe and sturdy. So our next exercise we're gonna go into is called a row. So with this exercise, you start kind of with your hands at your side, and then you wanna pinch those shoulder blades down and back, like you're trying to pinch them down towards the opposite back pocket. Initially, as you see, we're going to do that in a seated position without that back support so that we're working all of those good posture muscles. And then in a second here, you'll see that Renee is going to stand up and we'll do it in standing. Now, ideally, you'll be standing, you know, either in that safe corner that we talked about or with that chair right behind you so that if you do tend to lose your balance, you have a safe surface to sit down on. All right, our next one. It's a similar setup and a similar arm movement, but just a little bit different. So instead of like our last exercise where she had her elbows bent, she's gonna have her arms kind of straight down. And the idea is that you're starting with the arms up here and then pulling them down to your hips. I don't want you extending past your hips because that's not gonna feel good on your shoulder. Once again, sitting up nice and tall, good posture and then transitioning it into a standing position if you feel stable enough with your balance. All right, our next exercise. This is called a band tear. So what you're gonna do, you're gonna start with your arms at about shoulder height, holding that band right in front of you, and then you're gonna pull those arms apart as Renee is doing, thinking about pinching those shoulder blades together up nice and tall, good posture. And once again, once you feel like you're ready to progress, you can do this in a standing position, ideally with a nice chair behind you or doing it in that safe corner space. All right, our next, we're gonna work on some push-ups here. And you probably are wondering what that plus means and I'll explain it to you in a second. So initially I want you up at a nice sturdy wall or a door or something like that that you know isn't gonna move on you. 
you're gonna be just about a foot away from the wall, not too far. You see that she's relatively straight up in her standing posture. And she's gonna go down into that push up. And then at the end, do you see how she kind of gives that little push into the wall? That's that plus component. So that's really kicking in one of your big postural muscles that's in your back and your shoulder blade area. And then the way to progress this is you can go to essentially like your countertop in your kitchen, walk your feet out a little bit further so that your body's on more of an angle and that's gonna make it more of a challenge. Once again, you want it to be a nice stable surface such as your countertop that you know isn't gonna move on you. I wouldn't suggest doing it on a piece of furniture that could possibly slide. So she's doing that extra little bit of a plus push at the top there. All right, and our final one for our posture is what's called a payoff press. So as you can see, we have the resistance band instead of in front, we actually have it anchored over to the side. So once again, you can have a loved one kind of hold that band for you, or you can tie it to that door or to that banister that we talked about. So you're starting in a seated position, nice tall posture. You wanna activate those tummy muscles so you want to make sure that core is nice and strong. So thinking about bracing those abdominals, almost like somebody was going to come and punch you in the stomach. And then once you get those core muscles set, you're going to punch that band straight out in front of you. And ideally what you're going to do, you're going to do one round with the resistance band anchored over to your right side. And then you'll do another round with the resistance band anchored over to your left side. That way you're getting the abdominals on both sides really working, resisting that pull of that band. And just like our other exercises, you want to start with it seated. And then once you gain some confidence with it and some confidence in your balance, go ahead and transition into standing. So she's doing that same exercise where she's just punching it out. Sorry, for whatever reason, there we go. Video wasn't cooperating there. So strong core muscles punching out straight in front of her chest, essentially. All right, so now we're gonna go into a little bit of balance training here. Now this is essentially just some basic, just like we did for our posture, some basic exercises for initiating some balance training. Once again, we wanna be in that nice safe corner that we talked about. And the first one is what's called narrow base of support. So as you can see, Renee's feet are close together. Ideally, you wanna have your feet touching. If you've got some you know, variance in like your knee angle or something like that and you can't get your feet exactly to touch, just get them as close as you can. So right now, she doesn't have the chair in front of her just because I wanted to show you her foot positioning. But when you first get started with this exercise, I want you to have that chair in front of you just in case. So you'll see we slide that chair in front of her in just a second here. So you're gonna start just standing like that, working on your balance, ideally trying to build up to about 20 or 30 second holds. Once that's easy, transition those hands away from the chair. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put hands back on the chair and we're actually gonna do this with your eyes closed because a lot of our balance control comes from our visual system and from our eyes. So in order to improve our other systems that help with our balance, we need to close those eyes so that our body doesn't so heavily rely upon our vision for our balance. So once again, when you first get started with this hands on the chair until you really kind of feel it out and feel safe with it, building up to those 20, 30 second holds. And once you feel like you're safe with those holds, just like our last one, we'll bring the hands away and down to the sides, staying in that safe corner. And our next progression here is once again, hands back on the chair. And then she's adding in some head movements. So she's doing the head side to side, just comfortable range of motion, side to side. And then you can transition to up and down, about 10 to 20 movements each way. 
And then once you're comfortable and safe with your balance, you can transition to doing that without the hand support. Okay, our next one coming up here is what's called tandem stance. So that's essentially like if you were gonna walk a plank or do a sobriety test, how you would have one foot pretty much right in front of the other foot. Once again, I've got this chair out here just so that you can see her foot placement. But once we really get started with the training, we're gonna go back in that safe corner with the hand support given by the chair. So you'll just work on holding each one and see how she switched her feet there. You wanna do one round with the right foot behind and then switch and do another round with the other foot behind. Ideally, once again, building up to those 20 or 30 second holds and then progressing to taking the hands down to the sides if appropriate. And you can probably guess where we're gonna go with the next one. These kind of have a similar trend. So she's progressed it to moving the head side to side and up and down with the hand support. And then once she gets good at that, taking those hands away, doing your head turns without. You can see it's a little challenging. <laughs> okay, our next one, this table I would say, you know, use your counter space again, something nice and steady and stable. And we're gonna do essentially a walk, like we're trying to walk the plank. So you'll see that Renee's putting one foot in front of the other, using that hand to give her some support at the table or the countertop at home. Just walking that plank one foot in front of the other. And then as you feel comfortable and confident with your balance, take the hand away, still be, close within touching distance of your counter just in case you do lose your balance. Okay, our next one is single leg standing. Single leg stance we call it. So once again, just wanted to show you the foot positioning. She's just got the one foot on the ground, starting in that safe corner, and we wanna start with the chair for support. So she's gonna work on her single leg standing trying to build up to a 20, 30 second hold. And I would suggest as you switch your feet to keep your hands on the chair, because that's a challenging component too. And then once you're confident, bring those hands down to your side as your progression. And then the next progression here you can see that she's still in that safe corner. She's on that single leg. And then she's trying to raise her arms up and down. That's gonna make it a lot harder. So definitely make sure that you're confident with your balance before attempting this. Cause as you can see, it's a little challenging. All right, our next exercise is what I like to call a flamingo walk. And you'll see why I say that in just a second. So she's once again at that countertop, that nice stable support system, moving almost like a flamingo does, really bringing that leg up so that you're working on that single leg standing, but adding the challenge of moving while you're doing that. Initially holding on for support, and then once your balance and your confidence improves, doing it next to that support system without holding on if you can. All right, and our next one is a step over. So an easy thing to use at home, as you can see, we just got a shoe box and we'll use that for this exercise. Once again, at that countertop or that nice stable piece of furniture. So initially Renee's holding on and she's literally just stepping over that box. And this is working on balance, it's working on foot clearance, it's working on step length. So all things that can help with walking dynamics and safety during walking. Once she's comfortable, she removes her hands and is doing it without holding on.
And another way that we can work on this, you see now that she's transitioned to having both feet within just a couple inches of the box, hand back on the table. She's keeping her right foot stationary and her left foot is stepping up and over. As you can see, she was cheating a little bit by bringing her foot around the box. So I had to give her a little cue to make sure she was going up and over, really trying to work on being able to get that foot up and off the ground. And then once your confidence and balance improves again, you can do it without holding on. Making sure that you do this on both sides, about 10 to 15 repetitions, depending on your fatigue and your tolerance to it. All right, everyone, so that is pretty much the presentation here. So we're gonna unmute everyone. And if you have any questions, please just let me know. So do I just go?